Well, good morning, church. Good morning. I am so excited to be here this day with you and to be able to share God's word with you. As we enter into our summer series, we're going to be spending the next two months looking at 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John and being able to discover a lot of what he was trying to do with the church back then, which still holds true to us today. So I'm excited that we get to share in these things and discover more of that truth. And as we begin today, we're going to be talking about the light, living in the light. Now, I think it's pretty pretty neat that we kind of take time every year to celebrate the 4th of July. But as a kid, one of the the greatest things that I loved to do was go into the darkness of the night on the 4th of July and sit and wait in anticipation for what? Fireworks. Fireworks. And why was it so amazing? Because it lit up the sky. It broke the darkness. It showed us something different, something amazing. There's something about light, isn't there? It kind of draws us in. It kind of gives us a a point of comfort and understanding sometimes. We love the light. But sometimes even in the light, it can be deceptive, depending on where it leads you. Satan would like nothing more for you to step away from the light of Christ. He'd love to give you another light, a light that is very deceptive, but it is not truth. So as we open up the word today, we're going to have an opportunity to really dig in to what God is calling us to. Because one of the things I realized today is when it comes to light, people connect with it. But there's a lot of spirituality that's going on right now in our culture. And they want to be a spiritual being. They want to pursue something that's bigger than them. But they don't necessarily settle in on Christ. They just want to be spiritual. And it can lead them down all kinds of different roads. But yet, they're looking, aren't they? Just like we are. We're wanting to find meaning and purpose in life. And you know this thing called truth? It's become kind of subjective to whoever you're talking to. And we've kind of lost the edge on absolute truth. It's whatever you want it to be. And because of that, the spiritual nature that people are pursuing ends up being whatever they want it to be, apart from his word. But John comes in, and he writes to the church. He wants to renew them and restore them in this effort. John, also writer of the Gospel of John, he writes these letters to the church, wanting to encourage them in their journey of faith recognizing that they are being pulled away from a variety of different things in this world. He wants to give them confidence and assurance on what their walk can look like with Christ. You know, he wants to equip God's people, then as much as he does today. Equip us to be able to stand in the light, the light of Christ, and not be drawn away from anything else that this world may throw at us that seems a little interesting, maybe even attractive. But he wants to keep us on that straight and narrow path of truth. So every time that John writes, it becomes very evident that he's very passionate about what he is living for, the truth of Christ. He wants to help believers deal with their salvation and be able to live it out. Now, see, here's the thing that John knew. John knew that so many of us live for salvation. We live for heaven. We want to see the light, right? But John says, don't wait. For that day, when he's called for us to live it out today. He's called us to live out our salvation today. He's called us to live in the light of Christ today. And so many times we wait and say, well, tomorrow I'll get to it. Or when I die, I know I'm going to heaven. And we wait. And John says, don't wait. Live in the light today. Live out your salvation today. See, too many of us, we're enlightened by this truth the gospel of Jesus Christ, but we stop short of the relationship. Too many of us know about Christ in the Christian history, but many of us need to step into the relationship with Christ and make it real. And that's what John was trying to get us to. He says, just don't know about the light of Christ. Live in it. Let it pierce the darkness of your life and be able to experience the freedom that you can have. 
The overall theme that we're going to have for the next two month, months is finding assurance in our faith. That's really what John was about. He knew that many of the Christians were being discouraged because they were being persecuted. He knew that many of them were walking away from the light because they were being deceived by the adversary, the devil. So he comes back in and he says, you can live in the light. He will reveal the truth in your life if you'll just look. So many times we miss it, don't we? It's kind of like the, the man who was just taking a walk one night. It was dark, dark streets. And he was walking, as many of us would, you know, kind of fumbling around with our phones. We can never just be still and just walk, right? We always have to be fumbling. Well, he fumbled with it, and he lost his phone. He dropped it in, in the grass somewhere, and he couldn't find it. And he became frantic, and he got down on his hands and knees, and he began to look around, trying to find where his phone was at. But he couldn't find it. And this gentleman was taking a walk, and he came up, and he saw this guy on his knees looking around. He says, what have you lost? Can I help you find whatever it is that you've lost? He says, yeah, I lost my phone. I dropped it in, in the grass somewhere. He says, where did you drop it? He says, well, somewhere over there. He says, then why are you over here looking for it? He says, well, the light's better over here by the light post. <laughs> and, and the guy's sitting there going, that doesn't make sense. That doesn't make sense at all. If you lost it over there, why are you looking here? Oh, just because there's light. But see, so many times we do the exact same thing. We lose our steps of faith and we look in the wrong places. We believe that it's over here because it's attractive. And it has some aspect of light. But Christ says, no, I am the light. Me and me alone in the light. There is no other way that you'll find this truth but through me. But so many times we miss it. And many times we walk in our lives, church. We know that there's something missing in our lives. Especially those who have had a life-altering encounter with Jesus. We know where we're supposed to be walking. We know where we're supposed to be looking. But oftentimes we lose our way. I mean, life happens, right? Uh, we get busy. It, it gets complicated. We get pulled in a thousand different directions. No wonder we lose our way. No wonder the light doesn't shine like it once did. But then what happens? We feel empty, don't we? We feel like we're just kind of going through a routine in life. We become numb to the everyday living. We say, really, this is what God called us to? But we've missed what he's called us to. It's not just about existing church. It's about really living. He called us to have life and life to the full. But it's through his light that we find this. I mean, we're desperate. We're desperate and we begin to look for this element that's missing in our lives. I've seen it. I've been there. But if we're honest with ourselves, we already know the answer, don't we? What's missing? Jesus. We know the truth. And oftentimes we've sacrificed the truth for something else, believing it to be a better truth or a new truth or my truth. But apart from Jesus, we can do nothing. But in Christ, we are a new creation. The old is gone and new has come. But like the man in the illustration, we're much like him. We know that something's missing. And we begin to look not to Christ, we look to everything else. And we're never going to have that fulfillment. We're never going to have that clarity of the path that we're to walk apart from Christ. There is no way possible. We have to pursue him. We have to find our assurance in Christ and Christ alone. So let me ask you about this thing called truth. Number one, what is your life proclaiming to be truth? What is it? What is your life proclaiming to be truth? I mean, most of us, if not all of us, we've bought into the American way. Now, don't get me wrong. I love America. I love the freedom that we have. A freedom for what? What has this freedom given us? Has it given us a freedom to pursue whatever we want? Has it given us a freedom to create our own truth? Has it given us a freedom to walk away from the things that this country was founded on? Godly principles? <laughs> Faith in God? And freedom for all? We've lost our way. 
because we don't allow the light to shine like it once did. And as Scott said, freedom is never free. It always comes with a cost. And the freedom that we have in America came with a great cost to many. But the ultimate freedom that we can have in Christ in America is to share the truth about Jesus Christ. We have that freedom. But how many of us are living that out? If you're proclaiming such a faith, do we see it in how you engage with your neighbors, your co-workers, your family? Could we talk to your family and they say, oh, absolutely, dad's all about Jesus. Mom is all about Jesus. Is that what our children and our grandchildren would tell us, to tell me? Are we proclaiming this truth? What is life all about anyway? I mean, it's not about existing, is it? I hope not. That's pretty boring. I want my life to matter. And I know that you want your life to matter. So when you think of life, how do we define it? It's very important. Some would define life this way. The sum total of the choices you have made and the experiences you have had. That's how they sum up life. But I want to say there's more to life than this. Yes, that's a part of it. But where do we find Christ in the midst of all of it? That's the question. And if we can get there, we'll begin to realize what God really wanted. What did God want? We're not a science project. God wanted a relationship with us. He breathed life into us to be able to walk with us, to be able to laugh with us, to love with us. That is what God wanted. And that has not changed from the beginning. What has changed is darkness has come. Sin has entered into the world. But God's desire is still the same, that we would walk with him in the light of Christ. But you know, before Christ was even made known to us, God made himself known to us. He revealed himself to his people. And that is so important that we see this. We turn with me to Isaiah 43. Now, you may be saying, wait a minute, I thought we were studying 1 John today. We are, we're getting there. But too many times we miss the parallel between Old Testament and New Testament. There is so much that is connected between the old and the new. And we are so quick sometimes to just go to the new and forget about the foundation that was given through God. And what is happening here in Isaiah is God is speaking to the people. He's reminding them. He says, I formed you. I created you. I have provided a way out for you. I have given you hope. I have given you purpose. This is what God was saying to the people of, of Israel. But then he reached a point in that context. And he says, now gather up all the nations, those who don't believe in me, and bring them. And ask them about their idols. Ask them if their idols can predict what is going to happen. Ask them if their idols are going to provide what I have provided for you. Because he knew they couldn't. They never can. Because they're not real. They're just something made up, an idol. But then this is interesting. In verse 10, he says to the the people of Israel, but you are my witnesses over Israel, says the Lord. You are my servant. You have been chosen to know me, believe in me, and understand that I alone am God. There is no other God. There never has been, and there never will be. Is that powerful? That is the God that we serve And he was making himself known to them. But it wasn't just about him. He says, I've given you the opportunity to be my friend. To be in a relationship with me. To encounter me. God, the creator of all things, says, I've invited you in. I want you to know what it means in the sunset. I want you to know what it means in creation. I want you to know me. I want you to love me, for I have loved you. You know what God did? He called them in to serve. He invited them to be a part of his plan of redemption for all humanity. God called me as he called you. But then it was interesting. He says, in my revealing, he says, I want you to believe. That's his desire. That's an invitation, isn't it? God could have forced you to believe in him. But what kind of love would that have been? He gave us free will, didn't he? Free choice. But he says, I want you to believe in me. 
But not just believe in me, I want you to understand me. And see, that's the beauty of God. He says, I want you to know why. Why you're in a relationship with me. Why you can understand my ways. Because he revealed it. And that same desire holds true throughout the entire Bible. I mean, even in the New Testament, we'll find that he wants us to still be a witness to what Christ has done. But he moves a little further down the road from witness and says, I don't want you to just witness what and who I am. I want you to give testimony. And if any of you have walked through a discipleship class with me, what am I asking for? A testimony. Because that's where the reality of Christ is real to you. We can talk about Jesus all day long, but until he becomes your savior, your testimony will not have an impact on anybody else. But when it moves towards that, from witnessing something to testifying, that's when it becomes powerful. And I know this in, in one of the most practical ways. My youngest son, Tyler, T-Bone, he uh, recently was in, in a car accident. And he had his license for two weeks. He was coming home from the bike park. And, and he kind of did what mom said, wait till the green light goes and just kind of wait there for a minute and then go. Well, he did that. But then a truck ran through a red light and hit him and totaled the car. And instantly, this guy gets out and starts yelling at, at Tyler and says, why'd you run the red light? He says, I didn't. But what I learned about a witness was there was many there that day. And you know, some of them got in the car and just drove off. They witnessed it. They saw it. They experienced it. And they just left. But there was one, Tasha, your wife. She was frustrated because she was late to my class. <laughs> But she decided to move from witness to testifying. And she was able to give testimony to the officer of what really happened. And that was very beneficial for my son that day. But see, we can witness Christ and the evidence of Christ in other people's lives. But we can't give testimony until it becomes real to us. Do you see the difference? He doesn't want us just to see. He wants us to experience it and become the testimony that changes lives. That is so so important. Well, let's go to 1 John. In 1 John, we're going to pick it up in the very first verse. It says, We proclaim to you the one who existed from the beginning, whom we have heard and seen. We saw him with our own eyes and touched him with our own hands. He is the word of life. The one who is life itself was revealed to us, and we have seen him. And we now testify and proclaim to you that he is the one who is eternal life. He was with the Father, and then he was revealed to us. This is absolutely incredible what is happening with those that are moving from witness to testifier of what Christ has done. The importance of eyewitness, think about it. This is not just hearsay. This is not something that's just been passed down through a conversation. These were eyewitnesses that looked upon Jesus and his life and his mission. And they wrote about that so that we could know the truth and the reality of who Jesus is. So you think eyewitness is important? Absolutely. But they weren't just witnessing. They went on to live it out in their own life. And that's what makes it powerful. We could sit and talk, but he says, I want you to move into action. I want your life to matter in the kingdom of God. And this eyewitness was so important because you take ownership. They defined the significance of Jesus at a whole other level because they were engaging with Christ in a real way. They talked about him being the word of life. It's kind of like the roadmap that we are given for our lives. And he says, in fact, he's not just a roadmap. He is what? Life. And so many times we chase so many things believing that this will give us life. This will give us purpose. And Jesus says, I am life. I am purpose. So we don't need to look anyplace else outside of Christ when it comes to this. But then he moves on. In verse 3, it says, We proclaim to you what we ourselves have actually seen and heard so that you may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that you may fully share our joy. There's a purpose in giving testimony. It's to invite others into what you 
have encountered with Christ. It's absolutely amazing. Testimony, moving into, moving from witness to testimony brings about a change for everybody that hears it. And that's what we have to give. When's the last time you gave your testimony? When's the last time you allowed somebody to see the reality of Jesus in you? Just don't tell them that you go to church. Yeah, I go to church at True Life Community Church. So what? That means nothing apart from Jesus. Do you get it? If you never mention True Life Community Church and all you get to is Jesus, I'm good with that. Do you hear me? They'll find their way. They'll want to know more, but they need to know Jesus first. Why do we give testimony? Because it's invitation into fellowship. And what is fellowship? Biblically speaking, it's being willing to walk with one another in the journey of life. I want to fellowship with you as a fellow Christian. I want to take on that burden of life with you. I love you enough to walk with you. That's what he calls us to. And John knew that they were getting away from this. But the true source of fellowship is always going to be Christ. He's going to keep us connected, even in our indifferences. And somebody told me today that how many days is it going to be until football season? What was it, 60 days or something like that? There's going to be some conflict here, okay? All right? Conflict. Okay, I'm a Wolverine fan, if you don't know. But yet, we're able to have a spirit of unity. Why? Because Christ is the common ground. And Christ needs to always be the common ground, even in those things that we have a differing opinion on. Christ needs to rule. But he said what? Share in the temporary joy that Christ brings? Is that what he said? Hmm. He said, share in the eternal joy that Christ brings. So many times we chase joy in so many different things, we end up empty. But he says, in Christ you will have an eternal joy, and I invite you in. He said, I want you to share this with me. You see, John's heart for the church was so evident when it was about speaking about Christ and what Christ brings to us, the light. But John knew that there was going to be a challenge for every one of us. The church then, the church now. We have a choice to make, as we do every day. We have to choose to live in the light or darkness. Second point. We have a choice to live in the light or darkness. Now, most people say, oh, give me, give me the light. I want to live there. You know, I never knew what a dark house was because my mom had so many twinkly lights everywhere. <laughs> so I never knew what it was to sleep in a dark room. Still don't. You go over to her house, it's like lit up. You can land a plane there. But anyway, <laughs> we have to make these choices. But why are we drawn to the light? Because it brings about safety. It brings about something that's comforting. But Satan wants to take that, and he wants to abuse that. And he wants to take us down a path that is not the path of light. He wants us to believe that it is, but it only leads us down a path of darkness. So John, Olivia read this this morning in his absolutely beautiful scripture. I'm going to read it again. John writes, in the beginning, the word, capital W, because it's Christ, okay, already existed. The word was with God, and the word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through him, and nothing was created except through him. The word gave life to everything that was created, and his life brought what? Light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. Isn't that absolutely amazing? I mean, you can have a pitch black night, and one firecracker will light up the sky, won't it? It breaks through the darkness. And that's what Christ wants us to realize, that that truth holds for us. And again, he reminds us of this in 1 John, the fifth verse. He says, this is the message we heard from Jesus, and now declare to you, God is light, and there is no darkness in him at all. So do you think there's something significant about light? Absolutely. He uses it time and time again to point ourselves to the truth of who he is. And what light does for us. What does light do for us? Light reveals, doesn't it? It's much better to, to sit in a room with light because you can see things around us. Light reveals. Darkness hides. As scripture lays it out, light is equal to goodness often. And darkness is often equal to 
wickedness, evil, sin. That's how we see it in Scripture. But there was a Scripture that I want to read with you. In Psalms, in Psalms 109, 105, it says, Your word is a lamp to guide my feet and a light for my path. You know, that was one of the first memory verses I learned as a child. I remember that in Sunday school. And I held on to that because I didn't like darkness. And I wanted to realize and understand how Jesus could be that light. But he shows up and he makes clear the path that we are to go if we'll just give him the opportunity to show us. Now, why this verse is so important is because sometimes, church, we prefer the dark path. Now, we may not always be honest with ourselves. We may not just come out and say, yeah, I, I prefer the dark path. But we'd rather call it this. I'm overcommitted. Life is a little too demanding. You understand, right, Pastor? You know, when, when life gets a little bit easier, when this changes, when that changes, I'll, I'll get back to church, I'll get back to praying, and I'll definitely get back to serving. That's how it goes. We want to believe that we're on the path that God has laid out for us. We want to believe that the light is showing us the way, but we often walk away from it. Little by little, we do this. And darkness begins to creep into our lives, sometimes without even recognizing it. Sometimes you wake up and you say, how did I get here? It wasn't just overnight. It was step by step, away from the light of Christ. In fact, we see this in 1 John, pick it up in verse 6. It says, so we are lying if we say we have fellowship with God, but go on living in spiritual darkness. We are not practicing the truth. Spiritual darkness. Do we even know what that means in our lives? We have to begin to recognize what he's laid out for us. Spiritual darkness. Let's go back to defining life. Life is the sum total of the choices we've made. So what do those choices reveal about you? What do they reveal about me? Are we living in the light of Christ or are we having a moment of spiritual darkness? I can't answer that for you. But he goes on and he says in verse 7, But if we are living in the light as God is in the light, then we have fellowship with each other and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. There is good news in this. John recognizes that we'll get off the path, that we'll begin to have elements of spiritual darkness in our lives. But he says, if you live in the light, as God is in the light, he will make clear the path for you to go. And that's where I want to journey. This is God's plan. It always has been his desire. He doesn't want to leave us in the darkness. But he says, I want to pierce the darkness with my light and reveal to you what needs to change, where you need to go. But he also said, I want you to fellowship with one another. That's important because together we are stronger than apart. Satan loves to isolate us, get us off the path of righteousness. But then that's when we start going down the road of darkness. You know, when we have fellowship with God, and I hope that you do often, he reveals this truth in our lives because that's his desire. But again, you have the freedom Every one of us has the freedom to choose. So how are we going to choose? Are we going to choose the light of Christ or the darkness of this world? Well, most of us say, I don't want the darkness of the world, but yet we walk that path all too often. I choose the light. And guess what, church? I have to make that choice every day of my lives. So what is this light all about? Well, third point. What is the light revealing in your life? What is it revealing? I mean, that's the premise of light is to reveal. I mean, if you turned off lights in this room, you wouldn't know who was in this room. But the light reveals that. So what is it revealing in your life? I mean, it's as easy as a switch, isn't it? I mean, there's times where we go upstairs, you know, it's nighttime and the kids are it's ready for them to get to bed. And we said, hey, you know, clean your room. We look in. It's not clean. What do you do is turn the light off, close the door. You know, it just goes away, right? But sometimes that's how it is in our lives, isn't it? We, we actually have a moment, maybe even here, where God reveals something in our lives. We see it, and it's not where we want to be. Sometimes we just turn the light off and say, no, no. I don't want to see it, Jesus, not now. 
maybe tomorrow. We just walk away from it. Why do we do this? Well, verse 8 gives us a little bit of understanding. It says, if we claim we have no sin, we are not only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. Now, who wants to be called a fool? But yet, Scripture says when we say that we're without sin, that we don't have the capability of going down the dark road, he says, how foolish is that? We need to recognize that we each have the potential to turn the light off. Because Jesus will never force himself upon us. It's an invitation every day for us to walk with him. So why do we so easily get entangled into the spiritual darkness? Why do we go down this path believing that this time my sin, this time my sin is not going to kill, steal, and destroy everything that is good in my life? Why do we convince ourselves that? Sin is destructive. It'll never be good. But yet sometimes we believe that it would be. Because Satan wants to keep you in the dark. That's exactly what he wants you to do. He wants you to be naive to the consequences of your choices. He doesn't want you to see the light of Christ in your life. What happens in darkness? What adjusts our eyes, don't they? If we dimmed down the lights, took away most lights, eventually you guys, your eyes would adjust and you'd be like, okay, I can do this. It's not so bad. I can get out of the room. In fact, if I turned off all of the lights and only left the lights on in, in the hallway, it would be enough light for you to be able to get out of here. And see, what happens is little by little, we walk away from the light of Christ. And you know what happens? We'll reach a point where we don't even recognize the light of Christ because we have become desensitized to the things of this world. We become okay with the darkness that's in our life. I can deal with it. I can still see. I still go to church. But yet that darkness will continue to draw us away from Christ. There's power in choosing Christ. His light will reveal even the darkest corner of our lives. But the choice is, do we want to see it? Because he wants to give us freedom, for sure. In fact, in verse 9, it says, but if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all our wickedness. Praise God for that. That is the truth. But what is confession about? We briefly hit that last week, but confession is this freedom. It's admitting that I did this. Devil didn't make me do it. My wife didn't make me do it. My kids didn't make me do it. Maybe they frustrated you, but you have to admit I made the choice. It's about owning your wrong. And in owning that wrong, you're able to acknowledge the damage that it could bring to your life and the lives of others. But until we confess those things, we'll never be able to overcome those things. God can reveal them, but there's more to it than just being revealed to us. We have to turn away from it. We have to change our lives in this. But I think he gave us that promise, didn't he, in that word? Didn't he say, when you confess, I will cleanse you of all of your sin? That is the good news. He says, my light will pierce the darkness of your life, and I will wash you clean from your sin. I want to go back to John just for a moment. In John chapter 8, verse 12, he says this. Jesus spoke to the people once more and said, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. You see this over and over again? Jesus says, once more, I had to tell them. How many times has he has to tell us to change our ways, to open our eyes to what he is showing us? It's a constant reminder, isn't it? And then we see this final piece in verse 10. It says, if we have claimed to have not sinned, we are calling God a liar and showing that his word has no place in our hearts. Why is this again? Because we are so good at justifying our walk. We can say, oh yeah, I'm a Christian. I'm walking in the light. But as soon as they look into the corners of your life, they see very clearly that it's not, there's not much light there at all. Because we are good at justifying these things. And he has to tell us time and time again, that if we do not confess, there's a dangerous road that stands before us. 
But in that confession, there's freedom. We don't want to close the door on the light of Christ. We want to let it shine. Now, here's the thing. I know this. Many of you have had these moments on a typical Sunday morning just like this where you felt God pour over you. You have felt God reveal something to you, but you resisted it. You didn't want to acknowledge it. And you were just hoping that the service was going to get over so it would just go away. And you know what? You have that freedom. You will always have that freedom to walk away. But I promise you, God will never stop pursuing you. He'll never stop giving you the light to reveal these things in your life. In fact, in 1 Peter 2, I want to end here. In 1 Peter 2, 9, he's talking to the church. He says, the church is built upon Christ. He becomes the cornerstone, the capstone for which we will be called followers. But he said, there will be some that disobey. They know the truth, but they will disobey. And he says, the fate will hold true to them. Separation from God for all eternity. But in this verse, verse 9, it says, but you are not like that church. For you are a chosen people. You are a royal priest, a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God. He called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. This is a beautiful message for each of us. What does he tell us? He says, you are. You are chosen. You're a priest. You are my prized possession. Each and every one of you. That's what God is telling us. And he says, as a result, he says, you can bring forth the goodness of God through your testimony. Not just because you witnessed it, but because you're living it out. He says, your potential in Christ is so incredible. And it comes down to our purpose. The purpose of this life is not about us, is it? It's about the goodness of God being known through us. That's what he desires. He wants us to be a light into this world. And we're going to continue to study this. But he's called us out, church. But today is no different than any other day. It's your choice. It is your freedom. But understand this. God is a just God. And he says, for those who walk in the light, as I am in the light, his promise and provision is for all eternity, that which is good and perfect. But he says, those who choose to live in the darkness apart from me, they too have an eternal destiny that is apart from me. Not a place that I would ever want to go. So live in the light today, church. Choose Christ today, tomorrow, and forever. And let his light shine. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for John's willingness to challenge the church then and challenge the church today. We need the assurance of salvation in Christ. We need to be reminded that the darkness is always trying to push in. But the light of Christ can never be extinguished. And Father, I pray that each of us today would say, Lord, please shine your light on me. I do want to see the areas in my life that need to change. I do need to see the path that you are calling me to walk. But it's only through your light that it reveals these things. Jesus, I need you. I need you now. Lord, watch over your people and move them into a greater truth and understanding of who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning, church.